Talk about some of the clear signs that you see that we are in fact in the last days preceding the return of Christ. Oh boy, well you always start, if you're looking at timelines, if you want to find out where you are in, on God's calendar, you look at Israel. You look at Israel. And uh, the fact that they are two things. First of all, they're alone. The world's against them. Even America, for the first time in its history, has backed away from endorsing the right to exist. Our current administration has taken a step that is... Um, our support of Israel through the years has been spotty. We've betrayed them. We've not been clumsy. There's, it's, it's a pretty dismal story when you really look behind the scenes. But at least officially, we were behind them. For the first time, we're even officially cutting loose. And that terrifies me. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu held a special cabinet meeting on the Golan Heights over the weekend to deliver a strong message to the world. <laughs> It was the first time since Israel gained control of the strategic plateau 49 years ago that the government held an official meeting there. It comes against the backdrop peace talks in Geneva regarding Syria's civil war that's threatened to overflow into Israel. Syria's foreign minister responded, saying that Syria is prepared to use military means to recapture the Golan Heights. Netanyahu said dozens of ancient synagogues on the Golan testified to its historical place in the land of Israel. The Israeli prime minister said this week that Israel will never give up the Golan. And now the U.S. is saying it doesn't think the land belongs to the Jewish state. The U.S. State Department spokesman John Kirby says the Obama administration doesn't think Israel has any claim to the Golan Heights, which it captured in the 1967 war from Syria and annexed in 1981. Kirby claims Democratic and Republican administrations have always held the position that the land doesn't belong to Israel and that it should be settled through negotiations. Germany has also said a unilateral decision by Israel to keep the Golan Heights would breach international law, and the Arab League is calling the move an escalation. The Syrian foreign minister also claimed yesterday that Syria will do whatever is needed to recapture the Golan. The European Union on Tuesday joined in on the criticism of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's statement that the Golan Heights will remain under Israeli sovereignty. The EU recognizes Israel within its pre-1967 boundaries, regardless of the Israeli government's claims on other areas, until a final settlement is reached, Mogherini said as she spoke before a Brussels-based meeting of international donors who convened to support of the Palestinian economy. The UN Secretary General has denounced Israel for its continued settlement activities and demolitions of Palestinian homes in the occupied territories. In a briefing to the Security Council, Ban Ki-moon called the Israeli demolition a form of collective punishment of Palestinians. He said Israeli settlements are illegal under international law and raised questions about whether Tel Aviv's ultimate goal is to drive Palestinians out of the West Bank. The US Vice President has voiced frustration with the policies of the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Joe Biden says that Netanyahu has held Israel in the wrong direction with the steady and systematic expansion of settlements, the legalization of outposts and land seizures. He said that such policies have raised profound questions about how Israel could remain, quote, both Jewish and democratic. He warned that Netanyahu's approach was moving Israel towards what he called a one-state reality, which could be dangerous once Jews are not a majority. The U.S. Vice President also offered a grim outlook for peace efforts between Israelis and the Palestinians during the rest of U.S. President Barack Obama's term in office. He added that the U.S. is obliged to guarantee Israel's security and would do all it can to push Israel towards the so-called two-state solution. Officials in Jerusalem say a bomb blast that injured 21 people was a terror attack. Television images showed smoke billowing from the scene in southwest Jerusalem. CBS Radio News correspondent Robert Berger has the latest. 
originally they were having trouble determining whether this was an accident, a technical failure on a bus, or a terrorist attack. Now the police have come out and said that it was a bomb, a small bomb that caused this explosion at rush hour on an Israeli bus. A second bus also caught fire, um, and it's possible that one of the people that was critically wounded in the attack was a Palestinian terrorist. Mm. Robert, uh, on the best of days, uh, security is very, very tight in Jerusalem and across Israel, uh, but as we get closer to the Passover holiday, what are you seeing in terms of the security measures that are in place today? Well, security has been really tight here in Jerusalem now for about seven months. Uh, there's been a wave of almost daily Palestinian stabbing attacks. Uh, but a actually, those have kind of died down in the past month or so. People were starting to hope that maybe that wave was over. And now you have an escalation because most of the attacks that we've seen were done with, like I said, with, with uh, knives and here and there with guns. But this is the first time we've had an explosion during this wave of violence. And as you said, uh, you know, Passover is coming up. It's always a tense of a possible time when militants, Palestinian militants, would try to carry out attacks. Hamas has released a new video threatening to attack Israel. And it comes just hours after the Israeli army announced the discovery of a terror tunnel stretching into Israel from Gaza. Hamas has posted a video clip on the YouTube page of the Palestinian Information Center news site. And it shows Hamas terrorists preparing to attack Tel Aviv and Haifa with missiles. The video includes masked men reading, describing the rocket that they're planning to use to strike their so-called Zionist enemy, and then preparing to fire it. The threatening video comes just after the IDF discovered an attack tunnel built from the Gaza Strip into Israeli territory. And now a private company is suggesting it may have found a second. The unnamed firm has been hired to search for tunnels by residents of Israeli communities living near the Gaza Strip. Many residents have complained about hearing digging noises beneath their homes. Now, the company says it's detected a second hollow underground shaft that may have been dug by Hamas to carry out attacks against Israel. The shaft's location isn't yet clear, but it reportedly doesn't lead directly into the Israeli communities closest to southern Gaza. Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Yaalan is stressing that searching for more tunnels is the military's highest priority. He says that Israel isn't seeking another conflict with Hamas, but that if Hamas tries to challenge the Jewish state, it will suffer a very powerful blow. جمهوری اسلامی ایران قدرت نظامی ما قدرت سیاسی ما قدرت اقتصادی ما علیه همسایگان ما نیست علیه کشورهای جهان اسلام نیست I said earlier, there's two questions that we always get. One is where is the United States is probably the other question we always get is, why hasn't God judged America? Billy Graham, uh, Billy Graham quipped so colorfully several decades ago, if God doesn't judge America, you'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, Thomas Jefferson said the same thing in 1781. He said, uh, I tremble for my country when I recall that God is just and that his justice will not sleep forever. I harbor the fear that God's abandonment wrath has already started against America. And uh, uh, I think that, uh, 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 see, for years, when people say, why hasn't God judged America, my response has always been because of, uh, because of Genesis 12, verse 2 and 3. We've always stood for Israel. And I've always felt that our support of Israel was a shield to an overdue judgment. Because you look at America in terms of its moral decay and you go, you just may go through the list. It's, it's amazing. See, I found a very peculiar statistic the other day. Did you know that all the people that died in wars in the United States since the beginning add up to about a million three hundred, uh, 1.3 million and change, so to speak. We murder one million four every year in mother's wombs. The blood of those kids cry out to God. So. So you start looking at America, and it's long overdue for judgment. So I, I, uh, I, don't, I don't worry about Israel. 
I pray for it because the scripture tells me to, and I know because I know Israel's in God's hands. I tremble for America because I think the one thing that has protected us from an overdue judgment is gone. Studies show that sex-selective abortions are on the rise in the United States. Some cities are seeing an increase in unbalanced birth ratios that highly favor males. Thursday, the House Judiciary Committee held a hearing on a bill that would outlaw abortion based on the gender of the baby. It is also aimed at giving women legal rights if they are being coerced or solicited into having a sex selection abortion. There's at least 160 million missing girls around the globe because of sex discrimination. There's a lot of cultural coercion of women, even in the United States, to obtain abortion based on the fact that the child is a female. So what this bill will do is give those women an out. It, it, it basically gives them an awareness that they have a right to, to refuse to get an abortion if they're being coerced. Opponents of this bill admit this is happening in the United States, but say it is not enough to justify a prohibition. The Human Rights Campaign is putting pressure on North Carolina lawmakers to repeal the state's bathroom law. The law requires people use bathrooms that correspond with their gender on the birth certificate. Faith leaders are arguing lawmakers to stand their ground, but LGBT act advocates say that Christians are only discriminating. The most Christian of values says, love thy neighbor, thou shalt not judge. We are all God's children. Now, much like the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, the purveyors of hate may attempt to abuse and use religion to justify discrimination, but they ultimately can't get away with it. However anyone identifies themselves, take a look at the new sign here, all gender restroom, and if you go inside, this is the first of its kind for the LAUSD, it's a 15 stall restroom. Now under US, uh, LAUSD guidelines right now, they do have to make single stall or accommodations available for anyone who feels uncomfortable using a girls or boys restroom, but this is the first multi-stall facility available for students and it's right here on the second floor in a central location on campus here at the Santee Educational Complex and I'm here with a group of student activists from the Gay Trade Alliance who campaigned to make this happen. Monique Garcia, tell me a little bit about what you guys did. You petitioned, you protest, you politic basically with the right people too. Yeah, so we made um, our poster campaign with the It's Just a Toilet slogan. We made 20 classroom presentations, collected more than half of the students, over 700 115 signatures and yeah we were just like it was amazing <laughs> what a great political lesson for yourselves and also uh, tell me about this victory how do you guys feel now having this restroom here I feel empowered I feel like that I can do anything I feel like my voice was heard like that was the whole point of this, one of the whole points of this campaign for kids at LSUSD district to know that you have a voice and you should use it <laughs> but most um, concerning is the safety a lot of people on campus having mixed reviews and opinions about this because of the fact that both genders can use it at the same time. You've addressed that though. Yeah, um, our school, our bathrooms will be monitored. Uh, we have a text to tip program, so we can text a tip for any concerns or anything. Like, just if anything happens, you know, we have text tip, and we'll have the uh, we have community and schools monitoring and city year, so it'll be completely safe. All right. Well, congratulations, Thank students. You. Again, increased patrols and text to tip. Of course, there are gender specific bathrooms on campus as well.
just need you to say three simple words. God is gay. God is a boo man! This is my... Also on 7, a historic church in Springfield has officially been moved to its new location in order to make way for a casino. Crews actually managed to move the building faster than they first expected. It's just a building. Reverend John Sullivan captured one last memory of the first spiritualist church the way he remembered it as its pastor for 26 years. But we're glad to see that it's being kept so that we have part of history still here with this new MGM complex. The Reverend said he was glad to sell the church to MGM in 2013. The 130 year old building desperately needed renovations. It's $800,000 relocation, a true engineering feat. For weeks, people watched the church slowly raised off its foundation and onto this structure. And then the building began to move slowly. So slowly it was hard to notice at first. This video is sped up to show you the move. The church was transported about 600 feet from Bliss Street to its new location on the site of MGM Springfield. What is this gonna become? So um, we're still trying to figure that out actually. Uh, we definitely know it'll be a food and beverage outlet or a retail outlet. Other projects include preserving the facade on the old Union Chandler Hotel and preserving part of 73 State Street. The Springfield mayor said moving the church was a sign of progress in the city. Creating and enhancing and bringing more and more jobs, thousands of good paying jobs, with historic preservation, where it made sense and where the money was able to do that. Deputy Defense Minister Anatoly Antonov says Russia will work together with China to safeguard regional peace and international security. He also said China-Russian military cooperation is not directed against anyone. I would like to take today's opportunity to say that cooperation between China and Russia in the military sphere is not directed against someone. Our interaction is aimed at strengthening the security of our countries, taking into account the international obligations of China and Russia, and the fact that both countries are permanent UN Security Council members. He also blamed the United States for planning to deploy elements of a missile defense system in Asia-Pacific region. He said the move will not only present a direct threat to China and Russia, it will also have a wider implication as to undermining the global security system. Tonight, the latest apparent provocation from North Korean leader Kim Jong-un once again appears to focus on the deadliest weapons in his arsenal, nuclear warheads. A U.S. intelligence official tells CNN Kim is pursuing a dangerous path after this warning from South Korea's president. Activity has been detected, which shows that North Korea is preparing for its fifth nuclear test. President Park Geun-hye didn't say what activities were detected. A top analyst with the website 38 North, which has new satellite images of North Korea's Pungay ri nuclear test site, tells CNN his organization is tracking movement there. 
What we've seen in recent days is activity near one of the tunnel entrances where North Korea would test. So here's the tunnel entrance here, and here is the activity. It's a trailer or a small vehicle, which could, prob could be used for preparation of a test. For three months, Kim has consistently rattled his saber, testing nuclear weapons, firing a long-range rocket, test-firing missiles. He's launched a barrage of threats against the U.S., South Korea, and Japan. His media arm even sending out a video depicting Washington, D.C. being incinerated by a North Korean nuclear bomb. Why? Analysts say part of it is to counter large joint U.S.-South Korean military exercises, which have included practicing a decapitation strike designed to take out the North Korean leadership headed by Kim. Lots to get to with our next guest, CBS News science contributor, Dr. Michio Kaku, a physics professor at the City University of New York and really something of our earthquakes expert. So obviously your expertise is uh, needed uh, today. Interestingly, the 110th anniversary of the 1906 earthquake that destroyed San Francisco. We're now seeing obviously uh, earthquakes dominating the news cycle in the last two or three days, Ecuador and Japan. Given that we're talking about tectonic plates, are they at all connected? The short answer is no. Uh, we're talking about the Pacific Ring of Fire, yeah. stretching from Latin America through California, up to Alaska, Russia, Japan, and down to the Philippines. However, there are linkages between nearby faults, like for example, the Cascadia Fault off the coast of Seattle. It's linked to the San Andreas Fault, which you mentioned devastated San Francisco. So nearby faults can in fact be linked. So it's sort of like a, a wake up call. Mm -hmm. I, I was struck and was reading a great piece in the New Yorker about the Cascadia subduction zone. And essentially they were saying, that they're on the clock up there. If you look at the last time it happened, that they are now overdue in that area, in the Pacific Northwest, for an earthquake. But you think that, and really, I guess, any seismologist will agree that it's in northern Los Angeles where they should really be worried. Yeah, earthquake prediction is like voodoo yeah. and magic. Yeah. However, when you see the images from Ecuador and Japan, think of it as a dress rehearsal. There is a time bomb, a time bomb called the Cascadia Fault and the San Andreas Fault. Now the cycle time for the San Andreas Fault is roughly, plus or minus, 150 years. And the last big one to hit Southern California was 1857. Meaning that, in some sense, according to one clock, we are uh, overdue mm -hmm. for a big one to hit the northern LA area. So most seismologists looking at the San Andreas Fault would say that the next place to have a break would be northern LA.
America's fourth largest city overwhelmed by historic flooding. At least six people are dead, more than a thousand homes underwater tonight, and in some areas, the water is still rising. There have been hundreds of rescues across dozens of neighborhoods. This family evacuated just this morning. Even this 12-wheeler truck was no match for the rushing water. ABC's Philip Men is in Houston tonight where the rescues are still underway. Tonight, the nation's fourth largest city still swamped by what scientists are calling a one in 500 year flood. Emergency officials say they've made nearly 2,000 water rescues in the last 36 hours, including 45 residents of a nursing home. And hundreds at apartment complexes pulled from the rising flood waters. For the last 20 hours, rescue workers have been going by boat to get people out of the flood zone and into safety. Officials here say they have lost count of how many trips they've made. Moms and kids, y'all come up first. By the truckload, parents, children, pets rushed to safety. More than a thousand homes flooded. 240 billion gallons of water falling in 24 hours as even animals struggling to survive. Cows corralled by airboats herded to safety. Nearly 100 horses from one stable close to drowning. Frantic rescues getting them to dry land. For me, these aren't just horses. I mean, they're part of the family. At least six people are dead from these floods, nearly all victims of driving into floodwaters, <laughs> making families all the more thankful to be alive. You feel helpless. <laughs> you just feel so helpless. We have the best. And you're just happy. We're a good family. God answers prayers. George, the system that's bringing all this rain is barely moving. And with more rain on the way, it doesn't take much to trigger flash flooding like this. Severe storms in the southern plains today followed heavy snow in the Rockies this weekend. Barry Peterson is in Denver. Across the region, Sunday was not a day of rest. It was a day of working to clean up and shovel out. Mike Hillen is a fifth grade school teacher. Were you surprised at how much snow you got? Very surprised. It was a lot. This was probably what, maybe 18 inches or so. It's very, very heavy, very, very wet. The worst of the storm now over, this was the chance to get the last of the cars out of ditches. And the storm continued its swath of destruction elsewhere, flooding the streets of Altus, Oklahoma Saturday night and spawning a number of tornadoes like this one Saturday in Kent County, Texas. A mall in Hayes, Kansas remains closed after heavy rains caused a partial collapse of the roof. It was a good news day for air travelers. Denver International Airport is pretty much back to normal after hundreds were stranded Saturday when more than 850 flights, 70% of daily operations were canceled. It was a difficult weekend for residents of Donahue, Chile, like for people in much of the rest of the central part of the country. Residents are scrambling to salvage their belongings from flooded homes after heavy rains well above average caused severe flooding in the region, killing at least two people and leaving ten others reported missing. On the outskirts of the capital, Santiago, the rains triggered landslides that damaged water processing plants, creating a shortage of drinking water. Some three or four hundred people are left homeless, and well over four hundred others are trapped in their homes. President Michelle Bachelet met with emergency committees on Sunday, and schools in the capital were suspended Monday. The rains are expected to taper off in the coming days. Up to 30 people lost their lives in downpour and flash floods that showered the northern Afghanistan on Sunday night. Northern Banglan, Samangan, and Takhar provinces are most affected. Nasser Kohzad, director of Natural Disaster Management Authority in Banglan province, said rainstorms and flash flood killed 12 people and washed away several houses in the area. 
The flood also claimed the lives of six people in neighboring Samungan Province and 12 people in Takhar Province. Water shortages and desperately poor farmers are suffering crop losses. The figures were announced by one of the government's most senior lawyers. He said that about a quarter of the country's population have been hit by drought after two consecutive years of weak monsoons. He added that the government had released funds to affected regions. As summer approaches, there are increasing reports of families in remote villages walking long distances to find water. Temperatures have risen earlier than normal, increasing concerns about this year's overall toll. The sprawling Mekong Delta is in trouble, and so are the Vietnamese farmers who rely on the river for their livelihood. At least 39 hydroelectric dams are being built upstream, mostly in China, to help fuel its industries, and that's taking a hit on the water levels. The hotter and drier weather due to the El Nino weather phenomenon is drying up the water supply as well. The parched land is allowing seawater to seep inland, worsening the situation. Now crops won't grow and the shrimps are dying. This is bad news for the country's economy, which relies on exports of such commodities. Some farmers are being forced to take other jobs to pay back loans. Others are selling their land. China has said it will release more water to help Vietnam and other Southeast Asian countries lacking water. But the help can't come fast enough to the once fertile Delta. An episode woman was in for a divine surprise after a prenatal checkup at her doctor's office. Yeah, the ultrasound picture, which has now gone viral, revealed much more than the image of her baby boy. And she likes to think of it as a sign from God. Beth Sweeney has a story you'll only see on 14 News. Everybody was just shocked. Like, everybody's like, I have to see that, I have to see that. So I was having to drive this thing all over town to show, like, my grandparents who don't have Facebook and things like that. Allie Meyer is talking about this, an ultrasound picture of her baby that appears to show an image of Jesus on the cross. I think it's pretty amazing. She didn't even notice until about a week later when someone pointed it out at her baby shower. And she was like, do you see this? And I was like, see what? And she pointed to it and she's like, it looks like Jesus hanging on the cross. And so we took a picture of it and blew it up on my phone to get a closer look and it is so much detail. Like you can see the hair and like his legs crossed at the bottom and everything. In just a few hours, the picture was shared all over Facebook. My mom shared it and she got like 50 comments and people were asking for permission to share it. While she's getting a kick out of the interest in the picture, Allie also likes to think the image is a subtle message from above. I've been on a lot of medicine for my Crohn's disease and we've been very worried about it. Um, so I feel like it's a sign that everything's gonna be okay. With 